My name is Bastien Sachet, and I'm the CEO of Earthworm Foundation. Earthworm is a not-for-profit organization whose mission is the regeneration of the soils and the forests of our planet. We've done this for over 20 years by working with companies that are committed to change and helping them answer three key questions. In this series, we will discover the women and men who are asking these questions. Join me to learn more about what drives them and their ideas to regenerate our world. Today I have the pleasure to welcome Scott Poynton, the founder of TFT, the Forest Trust Earthworm, created back in 1999. We'll ask him questions to understand how he went about the journey, uh, and I think we will learn quite a, a few things about him and about uh, the organization as well. So Scott, first of all, maybe can you tell us a little bit about uh, where this love for nature and forest come from? Yeah, thanks, Bastian. Thanks for inviting me to speak to you and uh, and all the people who are watching. And um, well, I was very lucky. I think I grew up in rural Australia, um, not far from Melbourne, and uh, I was very lucky in a sense that my parents were very happy to let me run wild out in this place. And so I was constantly with nature. I also had four dogs, and um, they were always with me. So I just from a very early age, I don't remember life without being surrounded by nature, in fact. So I think it just got in me from that early time. And, and so after that, you, you study in Australia, uh, forestry, um, and, then, and then at some point you decide to leave Australia, right? Yes, well, you know, the, the journey to study forestry really came... Um, I, I was planning on being a vet, you know, I loved animals and uh, I was planning on being a vet. And then when I was aged 15 years and three days, I happened to listen on the radio to a very old man um, Richardson Barr Baker, and he was talking about his life protecting forests, and uh, this captivated me. And so I, I was very lucky. I, I think a lot of kids don't always know exactly what they want to do with their life, but I knew from that moment I was going to work in international forestry and try and conserve forests. So it was always a plan for me. I, I didn't know what that meant, to be honest with you, I, how, how that would manifest itself, what work I would do, what job it would mean. But I knew I had to study forestry, and I did that. I worked in Australia, got some experience, and then had an opportunity to go to Vietnam. There was a, a project, in the, um, an aid project in the Mekong Delta, looking at reforestation after the Vietnam War, they'd cleared the forest to grow rice. Because of my experience in Vietnam, I had been able to, whilst I was based in the Mekong Delta, I had been able to go quite a lot through the country. Um, and when I left there, I got called back on a number of occasions to be a consultant. And one of those times was in the um, end of 1995. Mm -hmm and when B&Q, which is a very large UK retailer, they were getting garden furniture from Vietnam. And they wanted, and FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council certification, had just really got going, and they wanted to be the first to bring FSC certified furniture to the market. And I knew one of the guys who was working for SGS, the audit company, and uh, he called me up, he said, well, you know Vietnam, we need a, we need a forestry expert to come and be um, you know, the technical leader, well, not the leader, but the technical person on our audit. I'm like, oh, that'd be great. Where are you going? Oh, Mardar Forest Enterprise. I'm like, well, I've been to Mardar Forest Enterprise and there's no trees there. Mm -hmm. said, what do you mean? I said, well, it all got sprayed by Agent Orange during the war. So all of the big forest trees were gone and not to mention the bombing and everything that happened there. Because what was happening was the garden furniture factory in Saigon was getting its wood from Mardar Forest Enterprise, mm -hmm. but there was a sawmill there. And so what was happening was the logs were being, and we went to the sawmill, and here were these beautiful, massive logs that were being um, shipped is the wrong word, barged. They were put on barges in Cambodia and brought down the rivers and canals to Marda Forest Enterprise. So all of this wood was coming from Cambodia. So how do you, how, what did you do then that, that yeah, changed? So, so it was a bit of a nervous breakdown moment for them, and they said, right, you know, okay, well, we've got to cancel all the orders. And I'm like, well, hold on. There's 2,000 people working in that factory in Ho Chi Minh City you're about 80% of their business. What's going to happen if you just cancel your orders? Um, look, there's other forests in Vietnam that aren't badly managed. They're not certified, but they could become certified if, if, if we got in there and gave them some support. So why don't you get your logs from there? Like, oh, we never thought about that. So, OK, let's talk to the furniture factory and see if we can find a forest enterprise in Vietnam. So this became, you know, what I would call the TFT model, which was build a supply chain. Um, from the retailer at one end um, through to the supplying factory out to the raw material source, keep it secure, 
make it secure so that other logs and timber can't come in. Um, but then work on the forest source to help it get better managed, give it some technical assistance. So um, we could get it certified in the future. How, how was it? Because I guess you, you started with seven companies. So you had to go around and, and convince them to invest a significant amount of money in a retail industry that was not very used to invest in its upstream supply chain at the time. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it was an ecosystem of change, I like to think about it. You know, I played a role, but there are other actors in the game. And the NGOs had done a terrific job in creating that tension where the it was a lucrative garden furniture market and the NGOs had created such a storm when they found out. I found out about the Cambodian wood in December 1995. Yeah. Um, and was working on trying to fix that when Global Witness, the UK-based NGO, released a report about this in the spring of 1998, mm -hmm. just as the garden furniture market and sales campaign in the stores was about to hit the road. And so okay. here was this big crisis and stores were like, had NGOs hanging off their buildings and it was very stressful. And, and they were like, well, we don't know what to do. They had no idea what to do because as you say, there was no history of companies investing in their upstream, upstream supply chain. It was all about, well, that's our suppliers. It's a bit of an uncommon approach. Uh, a lot of the ecology today is driven by punition, is driven by control. I would say by fear sometimes of other humans destroying nature. Um, since the beginning, I think TFT has been set as a solutions finder, a solutions developer to, to try to find something that works in a practical fashion. Um, can you tell a little bit about that? Because it's, it was quite radically different from the traditional conservation-driven organisations, right? Yeah, look, I think the difference was it all comes down to inspiration. Uh, I think, you know, the NGOs created this tension. But, of course, their whole model is about telling you how bad you are and, and making you into the villain. And you're not bad. If you're the leader of a retail company, you're not bad. You're trying to, yes, you're trying to make money, but there's no evil in that. And these people are entrepreneurial. But imagine if you took that skill and harnessed it towards conserving forests or protecting people's rights and things. And you can, because they're good people. So I always went in there assuming they were good people, that some consequences had happened as a result of their business that, mm -hmm. that weren't great, that needed to change. And then inspiring them to be the best they can be, to find their path to that outcome. So I think the secret to getting ourselves out of the troubles we face is inspiration. Absolutely. So in, in, if we go back to the, to the story of the organisation, you moved to Switzerland, you developed the TFT model, which is about getting companies from the downstream to invest in transforming the way forests are managed. And you do that for a few years and it grows and uh, teams are established in Indonesia, in Vietnam, etc. And then you, got, you, 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 you get to a point where you start to do great work in the Congo Basin with, with pygmy communities. And, uh, and at, some, at some stage you're, you're on a trip to Cameroon and then you realize something. Yes. <laughs> it was a big moment. Um, the Stern Review, Lord Nicholas Stern published a, what I can't remember the title now, but it was like an economic analysis of financial uh, of climate change mm -hmm. financial analysis of climate change what are the costs of climate change and this was his first attempt to put numbers on it because he's an economist and governments like numbers you know the the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions is energy burning fossil fuels for energy not a big surprise right and so america and china number one and two in terms of global emitters but number three on the list was indonesia I'm like, what about japan that's got a big industrial community number four was brazil why so um, and then, then you read further and you realise that the second highest source of greenhouse gas emissions was deforestation. Mm -hmm. um, and the deforestation was for agricultural production. So in Indonesia, clearing of soil, clearing of land and particularly peat soils, which hold a lot of carbon, for palm oil. And in Brazil, for soy and, uh, and cattle. And all of this, um, you know, the palm oil and the soy and the, and the beef coming into global supply chains was... 18% of all emissions, and, of, and I think energy was 40, um, deforestation was 18, and transport, all of the cars and everything in the world, was only 14. So I'm thinking we've got this great model where we're in, inspiring people to take responsibility for their environmental and social impact, uh, but we're playing in about that much of the game. And so on that journey, well, after much reflection, it was like, right, well, we need to start working in palm oil. We need to start working in soy and beef in these agricultural commodities because we've got this really interesting model. Let's take it out there. So there's another, another turning point if we follow the, 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 the course of history where Nestle gets challenged by Greenpeace for the 
supply of palm oil and their links to deforestation. And so you, you reach out to them and, and, and what do you tell them then? Yeah, so Nestle was a funny one. I, as, as you know, Bastian, our approach at TFT was not to be proactive. Like when, when someone got hit by an NGO campaign, we were not, I was going to say, we weren't first on the line to ring them up and say, we can help you. Not ambulance chasers. Not ambulance chasers. And we never did. We weren't even 10th in line. And the thing about Nestle is, you know, they, they, were, you know, they were casting their eyes to the horizon, looking for big, tall, grand organisations who could help them. So I knew, because of, by virtue of where we lived, we, I had some friends who worked for Nestle, a few of them reasonably senior, not working on this issue. But I said, listen, I think, I think we've got a way that we could help you. But... Is there someone there I could talk to? Yes, yes, talk to them. And anyway, we got over there and we started talking to the people and uh, at Nestle. And, and I remember Kevin Petrie, the head of procurement, he said, oh, that's really great. Look, we understand it. That's fine. But, you know, when can you come back? And, you know, can we work on, could we work on this? You know, what, you come back next month? You know, are we never going to see you again? Or are you going to come back next week? Could you come back tomorrow? I said, well, we'll be back tomorrow. It's 45 minutes down the train line. He's like, really? I said, yeah. You know, and so then became a, a relationship. Then you've, you know, you've recently celebrated 10 years of this relationship, and as a result of that relationship, and came up with the world's first native forestation commitment. I, I, I wanted to to ask you a question, two questions. One is, when you look back at the past 30 years of of your career, what would you have done differently? You know, it is what it is, and and I I don't look back with regrets on anything. I'm so glad that I didn't drop dead. Um, I would have been very upset with that. Um, but I think I've learned a lot. And, and through that journey, you know, when I now talk to CEOs and, um, well, just people that I'm supporting, I'm able to share my experience. And, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, if you, if you behave like this, you'll get burnout. It's another thing to say, well, I behaved like that and I got a really bad burnout and I could have died. You went through it. I've been there and I'm trying to help you avoid that. Not just for you, but for all the people who work for you. And if you can get them up above that, that stage, what great things can we achieve in the world? Because the world's not in a great place and we do need people to be the best they can be. And a big part of that is that overall sense of well-being. Maybe, and the second question is, is to our young audience who's, you know, they've got their career ahead of them. What, what advice would you give them if there was one thing that you'd like to tell them? Yeah, like, be true to who you are. It's that simple. Be true to who you are. But, but there may be a little bit of work needed to find that. Like, you know, when I was doing the work early years with TFT, I'd never set up a business before. I was like, there's an edge right there. But, well, you're in it, so you better get on and you better learn. Um, and, of course, that's when you cross those thresholds, you learn so much more about yourself. And when you've got a, you know, as a CEO, I had to fire someone. It's like, man, he's got kids and... You know, geez, but he's he's not doing the job that we needed, and I'd worked very hard to try and help him do that. It was a, it was a, it was an edge. So basically, it takes courage. I think it comes back to you courage, back right? To... You, you've got to keep you push through your edges, push through your edges, as and as you do it, as you as you push through those edges. Don't think about, don't don't come up here and try and analyse it. How does it feel? What are you feeling down here? And go with that. Go with that, and it's like, this doesn't feel right. Okay, don't, and don't try and analyse it. It just doesn't feel right. Okay, I'm not going to do that again. This feels right, so I'm going to do that. Follow the resonance. Set your sail to the resonance. Scott, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure, as always, to, to speak and, and I think to share a little bit more about the journey of TFT and Earthworm. So, very happy to have talked today, and I hope it will be inspiring for you guys. Yeah, thanks very much for having me, Bastian. I appreciate it. Cheers. Yeah.